have to take part in something completely new, which would change the conditions I had been living in before. When I think of the beginning of my life, there have been utopian ideas and nobody thought that they might become reality, but they have become reality today. After the war, Gropius began to make his utopian dream come true. He was asked to found an art school and expressed his revolutionary ideas in a manifesto published early in 1919. The school would be called the Bauhaus, building house, and the manifesto was illustrated by a dramatic woodcut of a Gothic cathedral, its spire soaring up towards the starry sky. The ultimate aim of all creative activity is the building. We must all return to the crafts. The school is the servant of the workshops and will one day be absorbed by them. Let us together create the new building of the future which will one day rise towards the heavens as the crystalline symbol of a new and coming faith. Gropius was not alone in his utopian aspirations. His school was supported by public funds. The revolutionary tone of the Bauhaus Manifesto echoed the spirit of the times. The Soviet revolution and the German mutinies it inspired helped end the war. The armistice and abdication of the Kaiser were followed by an abortive communist revolution in Germany and the declaration of a republic from the balcony of the royal palace in Berlin. The Bauhaus was founded in the old city of Weimar, where the new German constitution was also devised. While the Bauhaus began work, the politicians debated in a theater half a mile away. They met there because Weimar was less troubled by rioting than Berlin and because Weimar, once the home of the writers Goethe and Schiller, was regarded as the cultural heart of the nation. In these two buildings, a revolution in art education took place. It was a revolution which gave us the method of workshop-based training used in many schools of art and craft today. Dann war mir klar, dass äh, eine größere Verbindung zwischen den neuen produktionswaffenden Maschinen und dem künstlerischen Menschen hergestellt werden müsste. Und folgendessen habe ich Werkstätten errichtet, in denen die Leute von zwei Seiten erzogen wurden. Einmal vom künstlerischen und vom anderen vom handwerklichen. Es ist oft missverstanden worden, dass das auf Handwerk aufgebaut war. Das war aber eine Zelle der Vorbereitung. Man kann nicht eine Maschine verstehen, bevor man nicht die Handwerkszeuge verstanden hat. So the backbone of the Bauhaus in Weimar was its workshops, where the students, known as apprentices, acquired their skills not by designing on paper, but by actually making things. Chairs and other types of furniture in wood, for example book bindings, stained glass, implements in glass and metal, fabrics or ceramics. A major innovation at the Bauhaus was that craft skills were taught by master craftsmen while aesthetic inspiration came from artists. The pottery workshop was run by a master craftsman under the artistic supervision of the sculptor Gerhard Marx, who relished the bohemian atmosphere at the Bauhaus. Wirklich? Da war Leben, und zwar künstlerisches Leben. Also das hieß, dass man sich die Schuhe auf die nackten Füße malte und Umzüge machte und äh, rote Fahnen anklebten und so weiter. An Persönlichkeiten unter Schülern und Lehrern fehlte es wirklich am Bauhaus nicht. In my mind, the painters of the modern time 
had done some constructive thinking. They had developed a certain philosophy as to artistic space and colors and form. So I thought, though the final aim of the Bauhaus for me was architecture, that the painters might be able to bring in really the beginning of a new constructive thought. And they have shown that it was so. We have to pull the whole thing together. We have to destroy these separations between painting and sculpture and architecture and design and so on. It is all one. Gropius didn't employ just any artists in his search for teachers who could think constructively. On the Bauhaus staff were some of the most original painters of the age. There was the Swiss, Paul Klee, a mystic, as gifted a violinist as he was an artist. There was Vasily Kandinsky too, Kandinsky too, the Russian who, before the Great War, had virtually invented abstract painting. was now developing a visual language consisting of triangles, circles and squares, expressive textures and dynamically moving lines. Kandinsky's compositions made no reference to nature. They were shaped by the way he felt. Another painter who taught at the Bauhaus was Johannes Itten a metaphysical dreamer who was responsible for one of the many innovations which made the Bauhaus such a remarkable school. This was the compulsory foundation course to which Clay and Kandinsky also contributed. Johannes Itten's foundation course was the basic unifying factor in the Bauhaus for its entire period. Johannes Itten was there for three years and he was the one to invent this method of teaching where he would start off with uh, breathing exercises, with intense introspection, with a kind of Buddhist-like calm, which he learned, actually, from Buddhism. Itten was also a disciple of Mazdaznan, a variety of Zoroastrianism, in whose service he shaved his head and wore monkish robes, even while teaching. Well, Bauhaus was the first time in art and design education that the emphasis had been put on the individual student, the student's emotions and senses and intellect. And it was also the first time that design had been taught in a coherent way within an art context. A student would arrive and enroll for the preliminary course. And instead of previous preliminary courses, which had been all about the history of art and learning about the solutions of past ages, you went straight into abstract forms. You learnt about materials and their textures. You learnt about colour theory. So it was a kind of grammar that you learnt for six months to find out about your individuality and which direction will you go. That was the basic structure of the course. In drawing as well as in three-dimensional design, um, a great stress was laid on texture. We had to imitate texture of wood, of glass, of wool, of uh, anything we found interesting in contrast to other textures. And also, we were asked to build up three-dimensional structures of various materials. Since it was a depression, a period when they had no money, you had to work with what was at hand. So you would say to the students, go out to the junkyard and pick up from the scrap heap where you can, and then try to find out what's in the materials, in the nature of materials. Mm. 
my girlfriend, for example, had cut her hair short that time. So I used some of her hair for a combination of uh, things which I had found and uh, uh, built up into a three-dimensional structure. The Bauhaus invented the modern art student. I mean, up until the Bauhaus, art students were rather conformist characters who sat in serried ranks, all doing the same thing, all rather middle-class people doing watercolours and copies of antique uh, sculptures and so on. And from the word go, the Bauhaus attracted a certain kind of rather politically radical student. I was a student only 16 years old at that time. And I liked it in at the Bauhaus because it's so incredibly free and I could do whatever I liked uh, at the Bauhaus, anything, anything you liked. My little group went to the theatre and there was a statue of Goethe and Schiller and we painted Goethe and Schiller red. <laughs> The students were always doing these things, and I was amongst them. By 1920, the local inhabitants of Weimar are already complaining that they dress in this outlandish way. They dress like beggars, nude bathing at midnight, strange music at weekends. Because it was residential, they had these wonderful parties and theatre events and things at weekends. So, you know, your long-haired radical art student begins with the Bauhaus. So that's one aspect of it that made the locals very uneasy, I think. When Gropius opened school in Weimar, he said that he wanted everyone to, who applied to have a chance to get in. He said there was to be no deference to ladies. As far as work is concerned, we are all craftsmen. One of the problems, of course, was that many, many women applied. Far too many, as far as he was concerned. So after a year, he had to begin to segregate them and put them into various workshops because he felt that metalwork and furniture was too difficult for women to be doing. So they were directed into the pottery workshop and into the bookbinding workshop and into the weaving workshop which means, of course, they are stereotyped to a certain extent into doing what was considered to be women's work. Weaving is women's work. And obviously art can move into textile design and weaving more comfortably, perhaps, than more formal preoccupations. So that in the early years, the designers in textiles are producing these magnificent weaves, tapestries, which are there to be hung on walls. One of the most brilliant women students, Mariana Brunt, wasn't a weaver, however. A member of the metal workshop, she made some extraordinarily beautiful household utensils in copper and other materials. By the time Brandt was producing her characteristically refined and functional objects, the Bauhaus workshops had begun to move away from individually crafted pieces towards products made as prototypes with later industrial manufacture and a mass market in mind. Elegant, simple pieces are the forerunners of what today passes in every home for good, thoroughly modern design. Then they seemed startlingly plain. Everyday objects like tea infusers were designed in terms of their function and the need for mass production. Some products were already being manufactured in series by the Bauhaus workshops. A chess set with pieces signalling the way they moved across the board sold well. <laughs> 